thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and uh, this is my first time in this conference and I wanna thank the organizers for such a really rich conference and content. So I come from the other world of ultrasound that has been peppered here uh, in a few places. I think Shai showed some stuff and uh, um, Andrew alluded to it and then with some really nice posters yesterday. Um, and I also represent the other side of Manhattan on the west side, and uh, it takes about an hour and a half to get there, so start walking now. <laughs> so uh, I was asked to talk about function ultrasound, and I added also the ultrafast or ultrasound localized microscopy, and I'm going to show you how we can push the resolution, but we can also push both the temporal and spatial resolution to the point where we see things very similar to what Dimitri showed that you can't really see by naked eye. Uh, not at that scale, though. I have to, <laughs> I have to take the disclaimer of that. Um, so the functional ultrasound is uh, borrowing from functional MRI. Um, so it's a surrogate of doing uh, CBV and CBF uh, uh, maps uh, using ultrasound. It is not a technique that uh, my group has developed. This was developed by Michael Cantor in, uh, in Paris, uh, in uh, Institut de Langevin. And I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the basic method behind it, then show you what has been done, which is a lot over the past um, almost 15 years now in preclinical and clinical applications. And then I'm going to talk more about neuromodulation. So how we use it when we stimulate with ultrasound or stimulate electrically uh, to look at the changes in the brain and in the periphery. And then I'm going to show you very similar to the talk uh, from Technion this morning about how you can push the super resolution aspect using micro bubbles that we typically use for blood berry opening in my lab, but then um, uh, using them as scatterers, you can actually get the, push the, uh, the resolution very similar to what was shown in the optical imaging. Uh, the same thing holds with ultrasound. You can go 10 times higher uh, spatial resolution by using these uh, contrast agents. Um, all right, so first things first, the functional uh, brain imaging. Obviously, there's a lot going on, uh, and uh, we are going after the brain. Um, so typically, you have to trade off uh, spatial resolution uh, to with, um, uh, with what the scale is that you're looking at uh, in, the, in time. Uh, so typically, EEG, I think I can see that here, okay. Uh, EEG and um, MEG and ECOG, of course, they have really super uh, uh, temporary resolution. Uh, and, that, uh, and then PET is on the other side, obviously, um, can get the whole brain, but uh, on the order of uh, minutes, if not uh, up to an hour. Then MRI is here, of course, on the order of minutes. Um, and then we can get a lot of information, especially with fMRI on the uh, uh, cellular uh, blood volume changes and the flow itself. And uh, so there's a very rich field and you can go from brain mapping that we, that was shown today, uh, with functional connectivity, and of course, diagnosing pathology. So what can ultrasound do? Um, so uh, we call again, this modality functional ultrasound imaging, uh, FUS uh, or FUSI, some people call it, uh, analogous again to fMRI. We can track the cellular blood volume. And then the main thing is that we can do spatial temporal filtering uh, using single value decomposition. So this is where it gets a little bit uh, more um, subjective. So it depends what kind of flow you're after and what kind of uh, single value decomposition filter you're gonna use. But it does get you uh, somewhere in between uh, fMRI and EEG and MEG when it comes to uh, the temporal resolution, which we know ultrasound can push it up to thousands frames a second. So that's the main thing um, that I also wanna convey. We're going to really, really high frame rates um, so you can get high flow, but also slow flow. Um, so it is based on uh, power Doppler, which typically uh, uses uh, the Doppler effect, but with an autocorrelation where you're actually looking at the power under the curve. Uh, so typically when you have just anatomy images that look like that, so obviously ultrasound and the brain anatomically, we give that with the MRI. So you guys are on the right <laughs> line of business. Uh, but when it comes to functional, uh, we can do a lot. So basically you can do a high pass filter again with a single bio decomposition and then you can start looking at uh, different blood vessels according with the, uh, to the actual flow. And then you can separate them according to the timeline uh, on the power Doppler. Um, and then you can look at the individual pixel intensity that I'm gonna show you later on. Uh, it can uh, also show you pulsatility of the actual brain. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, 
the single value decomposition, you have the eigen values, you, you match them to the specific flow, uh, and then you can, uh, according to the weights that you use, you can make a map of that. Um, and then if you are doing a simulation, such as I'm gonna show you uh, a lot of the electrical simulation that we do, but also the focus ultrasound simulation, uh, you can match that, you can do a convolution um, with that response, uh, with a hemodynamic response, and then you can see which parts of the brain are highly correlated with the stimulus that you have uh, going into the brain. And then you can perform correlation, and then you can look at the pixel intensity like I have up here, uh, or a whole correlation map. Then according to what kind of filter you're using, uh, you can uh, start looking at tissue clutter, which doesn't do you anything except show you that you haven't uh, filtered out the stationary noise. So there's a lot of stationary reverberations, but also um, uh, other structures that are not actually uh, have any blood flow in the brain. Or to look at just cap capillaries, very small capillaries, to venules, to veins and arteries uh, closer to the carotid, so the, um, at the bottom of the uh, mouse brain. So according to the Aggie values and how they're, um, they are sorted, you can go from, again, slow flow or no flow to highest flow in the arteries. So then you can start making maps like this one where you can go uh, up and down in the Z, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Z direction. And uh, you can do the, this is after craniotomy in the whole brain of the, uh, of the mouse. And then you can also 3D render it and look at, uh, for example, uh, the uh, capillaries and venues in the cortex. Uh, this is separated by the white matter here and then looking at the, the larger ves vessels uh, more to the bottom of the, of the brain. So uh, as I mentioned, um, we have both high spatial and temporal resolution. Um, we can get to the functional brain connectomics this way. Um, and this has been shown in several different species. There was a nice uh, review uh, here uh, from a, a few years ago, uh, looking at mice, rats, pigeons, ferrets, monkeys. Uh, I'm gonna show you some of the monkey work that we're doing transcranially very briefly, uh, but it has also crossed over to clinical studies. Um, and especially where you find the fontanelle, which is basically when uh, the actual sutures of the, of the, uh, the skull have not completely gelled um, during the first year of life. Um, and you can go through this window, as we call it, acoustic window, um, in, uh, in neonates or some patients uh, that have uh, such a window. So it has been a boom over the past decade or so about using this pretty much uh, pre clinically, uh, looking at resting states and also free, freely moving rodents um, to uh, head fix mice and uh, doing the whole brain as well. Uh, and then sensory stimulation uh, uh, and epileptic seizure, seizure uh, to look at 3D functional connectivity as well as in the pigeons revealing the auditory system in 3D. And then some non-human primates work uh, in also uh, task related hemodynamics in, uh, in uh, working um, uh, uh, primates. And, and then clinically, as I mentioned, uh, in human neonates uh, to look at sleep states um, in, uh, in adults that have a permanent acoustic window uh, to reveal task evokes such as guitar playing, uh, hemodynamics and where uh, the, the actual cortex is responding to uh, the uh, motor uh, changes. Um, intraoperatively is also being used uh, to look at motor tasks and then also to reveal mouth sensitive evoked brain activation. So, um, so I'm going to show you some of what we do in, in my lab and a lot of that is not published, which I'm not happy about, but uh, I'm going to share it with you. Um, so we have, uh, we're looking at CBV changes. Uh, this is after craniotomy. Uh, so we look at contralateral representations and we look at the relative CBV change. Um, and then we have the left whiskers, for example. So everybody knows this in neuroscience, you just uh, have an, uh, a mechanical actuator of the whiskers and then you're looking at the contralateral motor cortex that is uh, lighting up here in blue. And uh, then the second one is on the right hind paw. So we have an electrical stimulator in the form of a needle, uh, runs at a specific current at a specific frequency. And we can see again, the contralateral um, hemisphere also lighting up as a result. Uh, of course, this is, this is a usual hemodynamic delay compared to the stimulus that you see there in orange. So you can make correlation maps as well, as I mentioned, with the stimulus, uh, and you can uh, see how uh, we, the activity uh, and where it actually correlates with, uh, with, uh, with the actual uh, stimulus on the, on the paw in this case, uh, sorry, in the whisker. Um, and we have this uh, contralateral uh, somatosensory here. Um, and then uh, with the electrical stimulus, 
uh, also on the contralateral uh, uh, somatosensory as well. So um, now we use, this is one is, it's gonna get a little bit confusing because I'm gonna use ultrasound also to stimulate. So bear with me, they're both called FAS. Uh, one of them is the big F, the other one is a small F, but uh, we're gonna put them all together. So one of them is stimulating and, and very, very briefly um, for the sake of time, you have a specific focus inside the brain and then you can cause mechanical and thermal changes. Now we're looking only at mechanical because thermal is used uh, actually for treatment of essential tremors in the brain, but we're not doing treatment here yet. Uh, so we gently nudging the brain um, by using this focus uh, inside the brain. And, um, and then we're looking at, uh, this is the focus here, uh, sorry, the focus ultrasound here that's starting. And we're looking at where the brain uh, lights up or, or has a CBV change. And you can see that although we're going for the center line of the brain, uh, we have actually the um, response, the CBV response on both, uh, uh, both uh, hemispheres in this case. So this is something that uh, focus ultrasound has been around as a, as a, um, as a technique uh, for a century. Um, so it hasn't been translated to the clinic until recently, as I mentioned. Uh, and mainly because we don't really know what the effects are. So MRI actually, um, MR guided focus ultrasound is the one that's, uh, uh, that's approved in the brain because it can uh, get you the small temperature changes. But if you're doing a mechanical simulation, uh, you will have to, uh, there's MR RFI, but you have to uh, exaggerate a little bit the pressure, which is uh, you can cause by effects there too. So this is a, one of the uh, areas that we really uh, are excited about where you can actually use the hemodynamics uh, to see what the effect of focus ultrasound is in the brain. So we had two different uh, mice here. Uh, this is zero megapascal. So this is basically where you have the focus, uh, which is it runs the entire length of um, the actual uh, brain. And then underneath it is the functional ultrasound image. Uh, and then we see the correlation map underneath uh, from zero megapascals to 1.7 megapascals, where again, you get bilateral response but it is uh, significantly different uh, as you raise the pressure of the ultrasound uh, wave. And then uh, more recently, we put the two together uh, where you're actually looking at uh, the force, the radiation force in the form of displacement inside the tissue. So you have three images going on here. One is the underlying functional ultrasound where you can see all the vessels uh, across the entire uh, depth of the, uh, of the brain. Uh, then you have the flash, which is basically the actual uh, on in red of the ultrasound and off in blue. So that's the actual displacement, which is in the order of microns. And then what's left here at the end is the actual CBV increase, which we see a lot subcortically. So we're very excited about those results. We're trying to understand them um, because we expected more of a motor, uh, uh, sorry, of a cortical uh, response, because obviously the ultrasound is on the top and we have less attenuation in the cortex than we have subcortically. Um, we are looking at the elasticity, uh, uh, th that is the other part of my lab that is doing, and it looks like the center, the subcortical region of the brain is softer than the cortex. So that may be one, uh, uh, one reason why the displacement is higher and therefore the CBV lights up easier uh, in the subcortical regions. And then when you do again center, so instead of uh, what I showed you before, it was left and right. Now we're going to, again to the center of the brain and we have the focus ultrasounds, the stimulations at the center, but both hemispheres again light up with most of the CBV changing again sub subcortically, relatively subcortically close, close to the hippocampus and the thalamus. Um, so this actually does vary as well uh, with uh, the pulse duration. So these are um, some videos that, hopefully, uh, yeah, they're running. Uh, so if you have one pulse of the ultrasound, and this is only on the uh, uh, left hemisphere, and again, this region of the thalamus close to the hippocampus is actually the one that's responding the most. As we increase uh, the number of pulses, it's responding more and more. You can see more of the red displacement. Uh, and then uh, sure enough, uh, when we actually threshold it uh, with the correlation map, we also see the CBV change there too as well. And then uh, the same way, uh, you can actually see the effect uh, increasing with the actual pulse duration on the number of pulses. We can also increase it with the, with the pressure. So you can go from nothing happening at one megapascals to actually engaging a, a lot of the region here at four megapascals. 
And you can see when you go uh, right hemisphere, uh, in this case, um, versus left hemisphere, we do have some uh, CBV maps uh, that are around the 5% range of where our noise is on the contralateral side, but much higher where we get the response where the focus of the ultrasound is. And of course, you can make also a map of that. Um, okay, so uh, the last thing I want to talk about with the functional ultrasound is that uh, how well it translates to uh, non-human primates. Um, so in ultrasound, uh, we actually scale everything to the wavelength. So obviously, when you're looking at mice, uh, you have about a seven millimeter depth of the whole uh, mouse uh, brain. So you have to go higher frequencies. In our case, will be 15 to 40 megahertz uh, to get up to 50 micron resolution. So, um, and unfortunately, uh, we want to do everything through the skull. Uh, we like non-invasive. So the skull, obviously, of a non-human primate is much thicker. There is no way that you again, we're going to get uh, higher frequencies like that through the uh, primate skull. So the imaging transducer also that is available to actually go through the skull um, does not uh, penetrate very well. So we had to devise our own imaging transducer. We had to um, basically customize it from a manufacturer uh, uh, at Vermont, which is a company in France, and go uh, to 500 kilohertz. And we call this L500, it's a linear array uh, that can cross through, uh, to, through the uh, primate skull. And uh, so then you have, uh, we also do compounding to image um, so that we can overcome uh, the uh, plane wave imaging a low resolution because we give away resolution to get really high frame rate. And then we tested it through uh, the non-human primate skull with a flow tube that runs microbubbles uh, to make sure that we can actually detect uh, uh, the um, uh, flow uh, through the uh, human, uh, through, sorry, through the primate skull. And then we proceeded uh, to do this in a monkey. So these are uh, a couple of, uh, this is uh, Sue Bay in my lab and Forty Sitters, uh, who is a student and a postdoc in the lab. And you can see the transducer here. Uh, being uh, prepped uh, for the monkey. Uh, and we have basically the transducer, uh, two transducers here, one in imaging and one uh, focused ultrasound, the big one here, the cylinder. And then we do MRI at the end of it uh, to see uh, what, how well we did uh, both from the targeting and also of the actual uh, focusing. Um, so we have different pre-stimulus frames, stimulus frames and post-stimulus frames, and we trigger everything through the Verasonics, which is a scanner. Um, and then uh, in this case, we actually uh, had the focus ultrasound part at 250 kilohertz. And as I said, the imaging part at 500 kilohertz. So we targeted the right somatosensory sensory uh, with, uh, for, uh, with neuro neuronavigation um, with the MRI. And then during the procedure, uh, since we had the confocal imager, uh, we were able to image other things on the brain. So uh, this is the skin and this is the, the muscle. Uh, if, for people who work with non-human primates, especially rhesus macaques, they have a very thick uh, muscle. Um, so we can see that. We can see the skull. Of course, we can't see the brain anatomically. So, um, but in both subjects, we were able to see the angle of incidence, which is very important for us uh, to be able to see how, how much of refraction we're going to get um, or phase aberration. And then uh, we did the same uh, functional imaging that I showed you earlier with uh, the power Doppler and SVD. And we were able to localize it in this case, uh, much closer to the skull uh, in uh, uh, three, four different sessions, uh, uh, focused uh, ultrasound uh, where we stimulated and we had pretty high uh, CBB changes uh, in all cases. Um, and this is another case where we actually uh, matched it with the simulation. So this is a simulation where it simulates the muscle, which gets you about 20% attenuation of the ultrasound, the skull. And then this is the overall focal spot that we see as an ellipsoidal shape. Uh, with that transducer. Uh, and then we're able to see that uh, we have uh, regions of blood flow changes interrupted potentially from um, a white matter tracts. Um, so you get both the increases and decreases. And we're trying to actually see uh, whether uh, we have this blood stealing effect that is very well known in fMRI. So the, the, the actual brain is borrowing uh, blood from one region uh, to be able to um, respond to the stimulus uh, and then result, and then goes back, both of them go back to normal. So this is for the brain stimulation. Uh, but we also did that in the periphery. Um, so uh, for, for, pain, um, for, for pain mitigation. So uh, in this case, uh, you split the transducers, you have now the imaging transducer on the, on the brain, 
And uh, we use, again, very high frame rate. Um, and, uh, and then we do the stimulation on the nerve. So this is to uh, mitigate neuropathic pain uh, non-invasively. And uh, this is the, the uh, sciatic, sciatic nerve, which is a mixed nerve. That means uh, it uh, uh, codes for both pain and motor. And then what we looked at is uh, the, uh, the actual functional ultrasound before focused ultrasound, during focused ultrasound on the nerve, and then after. And what we found out was, again, some regions of the cortex are lighting up, but also the subcortical region here. And then after we switch off the focus ultrasound, it doesn't all go back to, to the original uh, baseline. Um, we have actually a region that's lingering, the same region that's lingering, and then the, some more cortical regions that are lighting up, potentially also uh, detecting pain. So we don't know exactly what that means, but we're trying to uh, find out with pain models. Um, and then uh, we do see that uh, we can increase uh, the, um, uh, the CBV as a result of the sciatic nerve stimulation, and we can measure the area under the curve um, uh, from the contralateral region versus the ipsilateral, and we see a very nice correlation of how fast the, uh, the paw was stimulated um, with focus ultrasound and the area uh, of the CBV, the area under the curve of the CBV. Uh, and then for the... Uh, for the, uh, for the left hind limb versus the sham, uh, we have a, a very uh, a large distinction. So in the sham, basically, there, uh, there's pretty much uh, nothing happening. This is where the actual focus ultrasound uh, is, uh, is, not, uh, is on, but it, there's no uh, transmission of waves. Uh, so everything else stays the same. And once the actual uh, focus is on, uh, we're able to see that the actual contralateral side uh, is uh, higher than the ipsilateral, but we still have some responses of the ipsilateral region. So uh, that's all for the, for the functional ultrasound per se. And now I'm going to go uh, transition to the second part with the super resolution. Um, so my lab also does uh, opening of the blood brain barrier for drug delivery and also immune response stimulation. So we'll be working with ultrasound and microbubbles, uh, the microbubbles which are used actually uh, for cardiac ultrasound to enhance uh, the uh, contrast, uh, contrast of the heart. Um, and we'll be using them to inject them in, in uh, the actual bloodstream. And then once the focused ultrasound is on, uh, instead of just modulating and stimulating the, uh, the actual brain, we open the blood brain barrier, then we inject uh, gadolinium or also drugs according to what we want to treat. So I'm going to show you uh, what we actually do for treatment and then how we transition that to, uh, to the super resolution. Uh, so these bubbles are on the order of one micron in diameter, uh, and uh, they're basically designed as resonators. So they respond to the ultrasound beam. Uh, in megahertz, you have one to two microns as the resonance uh, size. And then when we hit them, uh, we, these are the white, this is an animation that we put together a, a few years back now. Um, and then with the ultrasound beam uh, at the megahertz frequency, they actually uh, make to oscillate and they engage the, uh, the surrounding blood vessels, uh, which uh, then have the blood brain barrier, which is the form of tight junctions relaxed. And then finally the actual uh, uh, drug or whatever is flowing inside the tissue as a specific size can flow uh, to treat the neuron, in this case, we're looking at Alzheimer's and Parkinson's treatment. And then you, you have gadolinium, of course, contrast enhanced imaging that can get you, uh, as you guys know, the actual region of where we open because the gadolinium does not penetrate through the blood brain barrier except if it's opened. And then we also can do uh, K-trans permeability mapping to see how much it has actually opened. Uh, completely safe when it comes to T2-weighted and SWI-weighted imaging within a specific uh, range of parameters. Okay, so these bubbles, again, are, are actually used for contrast uh, imaging and ultrasound. So we use them for therapy and now we, we came the other way and uh, we also wanna use them in imaging. So, uh, and then of course, we're gonna combine the two as I'm sure you could tell. So this is basically what uh, the ultrasound image looks like. So you can see you know, vaguely the two hemispheres here and some of the um, hippocampal arteries. And then the bubbles here by eye, you can see them coming in and flowing. Um, and uh, you can do SVB filtering here. And if you were to track these bubbles, now uh, the, the resolution in, on the ultrasound side, as I said, is on the order of uh, 100 to 50 microns max. Um, and then if you do actually uh, tune that to the bubbles themselves, which are one micron in diameter, you can actually uh, push that down to uh, uh, five microns from tens uh, one-tenth of the resolution that you uh, started with. 
And uh, these two already showed um, you, you deconvolve and localize the microbubbles very similar to localization microscopy. So we always learn from the optical imaging uh, colleagues. Uh, and then we're able to basically localize where the bubbles are at different times. And then once you start tracking those, instead of the blood flow, you're able to get uh, much better resolution. So now the vessels are much finer. Um, and uh, we can uh, not only uh, uh, check uh, exactly how the arterial tree is in, uh, is in the in the brain, but also visualize better what happened to individual uh, blood vessels, which you couldn't do before. And then, of course, you can track the flow there. You can track the bubbles themselves, and you can have uh, the actual blood flow and how it changed throughout the brain. Uh, this is some of the work that uh, one of my uh, former students, who is now professor at Polytechnic Montreal, is doing, and. Uh, I was really impressed by that. Uh, so he, he showed it at his invited talk at Atropoli Atrosonics uh, last month, and I asked him for the slides. So the, this is basically what it looks like when you have the blood flow at the same time as the uh, qualitative microbubble change. And you can look at the actual subtility uh, inside uh, the actual um, uh, brain. And then you can also zoom in and out and look at uh, the capillaries and the flow direction uh, in uh, the arteries, the capillaries and the venules here. So, um, so now we're going to combine it, obviously, with a functional ultrasound, or, or uh, in this case, ULM, with a blood-and-berry opening. So, um, so I already showed all that. Uh, we actually have before focused ultrasound, after focused ultrasound, but also during. Um, and uh, the during part is actually when you have the effect of uh, the actual bubbles oscillating, which is called cavitation. And, um, and then we can look at uh, the difference between before and after focus ultrasound and identify some regions uh, and what happened to the actual uh, brain. And then, well, of course, we use MRI as a gold standard to actually see whether we have uh, edema, uh, the in contrast. Um, so these are some of the uh, actual parameters uh, that we're using. Uh, and uh, we use about, in this case, uh, 15 megahertz um, no, sorry, 17.5 megahertz center frequency. And we do two things. One, uh, we have devised this technique called theranostic ultrasound. So that basically does imaging and therapy at the same time. Um, so with one transducer, and this is after craniotomy, we can actually uh, use it to both uh, image the bubbles and also drive them to do the reopening. Uh, and then we also can steer uh, as uh, the, the typically, typical linear array is doing. Uh, with uh, 120 elements uh, that allows us to actually scan the entire brain. And then well, the, what I showed you before in the non-human primates is, uh, was that we can actually have confocal, uh, the cavitation detection with a focused ultrasound. And uh, that can be done completely uh, without, crani uh, without any craniotomy, so through intact skin and skull. So we open the blood brain barrier and then we image uh, interchangeably uh, where we open. So during the theranostic ultrasound, so, so while we're actually uh, imaging, we can also see the cavitation. So this is something that you can see here in yellow. This is the actual beam. Uh, you can look at this ULM, uh, the uh, ultrasound localized microscopy image, and you can actually see individual vessels. And what happens is that uh, something that has, has been also confirmed with uh, two-photon microscopy by, uh, by other groups, that you have constriction of those vessels. So in our case, we see these vessels disappear in our image. So we still have our resolution, um, um, the resolution challenged here. Uh, but the MRI also shows you, uh, this is a 9.4 Tesla with gadolinium, that you also have uh, enhancement of the gadolinium where you actually opened and detected in real time. So this vessel constriction happens uh, uh, pretty much uh, in every mouse, and these are three different mice. Um, so in the treated hemisphere, we, all, we have vessel diameters that are, uh, have, uh, uh, are getting smaller in diameter, while in the control lateral, uh, they stay the same. And then the flow speed is something, again, that we're looking at between where we opened on the left and where we actually had as a control lateral. Um, uh, uh, control, and we're able to see that in treated, we have a significant flow speed change uh, in, uh, in the treated hemisphere versus um, the uh, non-treated. Um, and also we can uh, have control over that. So basically the ULM intensity, we can see where we actually had the difference, a change, and also it changes with the pressure. So the higher the pressure, the more control we have in this constriction of the vessel. 
And we also can visualize damage, which we're very happy about. We used to always have to do MRI, which is unfortunately for us because we don't do everything in the inside the MRI system. We have to basically take the mice uh, uh, in another room and then, of course, uh, do everything else after that. So we want to do the real-time aspect. And we were happy to see that we can actually match some of what we see um, in uh, is as a decrease uh, in the flow here with edema on a weighted MRI. Uh, and that, of course, increases uh, with pressure. Of course, you can also open without any edema, which we knew. Uh, but once you have edema, it's something that you can read from the ULM image. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one and, uh, and get to the conclusion. So uh, we have, I showed you two different uh, imaging modalities and one therapeutic modality from ultrasound. Uh, so with the functional ultrasound, we can quantify small to large blood vessels in the mouse brain. Um, we can also quantify CBV with or without uh, craniotomy. Uh, and we can do this during different types of stimulation uh, from electrical to focus ultrasound. And that can happen in both mice and non-human primates. And of course, we're moving that uh, slowly but surely to, to humans. Um, we want to, we also are doing, uh, we're looking at the cause and effect. So the cause of the focused ultrasound or the effect of the CBV um, uh, simultaneously. And then we can do this for both central and peripheral modulation with focused ultrasound. On the ULM aspect, we uh, harness a lot of the resolution capabilities and we can increase the resolution by, by 10 times, look at the brain possibility, the vessel constriction during blurry berry opening, as well as some of the damage that uh, could be caused during blurry berry opening and also uh, blood flow changes uh, during uh, the um, uh, BUV opening. So I wanna acknowledge uh, the, uh, uh, all the team that has worked hard for this, uh, our sponsors and the entire group. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, amazing images. Um, we have time for only one question. Question. <clears throat> uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, you called it fuss, but I think of it as fun. And what you showed us is fun fussy. Uh, <laughs> Good. And, uh, I'll use that. Yeah, it's really, really and, and definitely your lab is the pioneer in, in doing this. Um, I was wondering why uh, you use such an extended focus for the, for the stimulation. It was very fascinating that the activation seems to be subcortical, but uh, what, your lab also did a lot of very highly targeted uh, stimulation. I'm wondering why, why didn't you look at that? So, we, so that's because we prioritize uh, non-invasive. Uh, if we do craniotomize mice, we can go really high frequency and really have a very small focus to the point where you can also move millimeters. Uh, maybe we should do that because I know NIH loves cellular resolution, right? Um, but we 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 actually more uh, interested in clinically translating that. So um, in the mice, you cannot go above four megahertz transcranially. I mean, you can, but it's going to break up your focus. So that's why you 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 basically stuck. Um, and the, this foci that I showed you, thanks for asking that, is 1.5 megahertz. So you can go three times less. And that's why the more localized at the uh, thalamic region of the hippocampus, hippocampus and thalamus there, that was at four megahertz. So you, you can actually go down to about three millimeters now, transcranially. And uh, unless someone else comes, uh, can, you, can you discuss uh, the, the, the localization microscopy is really amazing. I don't know how long the bubbles can flow in it. Maybe if you can tell us kind of on the limits of that, uh, Maybe some of the downsides as well. Really yeah, very good question. Yeah, uh, so there, the um, the bubbles. Uh, so you can, there's different ways, and we are not doing it the most optimal way, by the way. We do a bolus injection, which is the worst thing you can do for imaging because it, it gushes in and then gushes out, or rush in, rush out, as we say in uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound. Um, so, but you can do a, uh, an effusion um, that uh, can allow you um, to do hours of actually infusing the same bubbles. Of course, they're filtered by the kidneys and the liver, um, and you may have to replenish those bubbles, but uh, some people are doing it actually in, uh, uh, when they do opening of the blood barrier, especially in people, especially when it takes, you know, in some other people's hands, it takes hours to basically do multiple locations. Um, so it's definitely doable. 
And then the concentration is very important in ULM. So, um, and there's two different schools of thought, uh, whether you should saturate the vessels and completely, you know, use uh, higher, really high concentrations of bubbles so that you enhance the contrast, or should you space them apart uh, to be able to see one by one. So, um, so there's a lot to optimize still that I think is a field we have ways to go. Let's take the next questions after the session. So thank you so much again.